Today on the Banter Says Podcast, we'll be discussing companies trying to make content creators a lot more money, aka making themselves a lot more money, and a whole lot more, so go ahead and stick around. Let's start by discussing Spotify and podcasts. Spotify is considering a couple of new monetization strategies for podcasts, one being a paid subscription model and another being a la carte. This comes from a TechCrunch article, which I will link in the show notes. They are saying that in the fourth quarter earnings report from Spotify, that Spotify is suggesting there would be both ad-supported subscriptions and a la carte options. As I just mentioned, option one is ad-supported subscriptions. And I went ahead and looked at a tweet thread about this, and it turns out there will be three different tiers for this. You can pay $3 a month for a podcast, and you will get the exclusive content, but you will also get advertisements. So you're paying $3 a month for one podcast, I believe, and you are still getting served ads. If you jump up to $5 a month, you will get that exclusive content, but no ads. And if you jump up to $8 a month, you will be getting ad-free exclusive content early. You will be getting first access to that content for $8 a month. And option two is a la carte. And based on what I read, it seems that this means you will be able to buy specific episodes of a podcast. I'm guessing I am hoping that that purchased episode of a podcast would be ad free. I think option one for the exclusive content is very similar to YouTube's membership where you pay for exclusive content from a specific YouTube channel. And I do think that could potentially work. I do wish that YouTube would go ahead and roll out that if you are a member of a specific channel, you don't see advertisements on that channel. And if you're a YouTube premium member, that you would, would get one free membership per month. But that is beside the point. The point is, I get it. I understand if there is a podcast that a listener likes so much that they want additional content and they're willing to pay for that podcaster to, to produce it, Spotify is acting as the intermediary here. I get it. They are looking at, what is it? Not PayPal. What's the big one? The big one, Patreon. Spotify is looking at Patreon and seeing they're earning how much every single month? Over $100,000 every single month? or $75,000 a month, why don't we do that? That's what they're looking at and thinking there is a lot of money to be made here. I think they'll find that the majority of shows out there do not have loyal enough followings to generate $75,000 a month. That is a very rare occurrence. Then you have option two, which I was very excited about because I was thinking it was going to be more of a value for value type thing. You like a show. Spotify has a donate button, send five bucks to them, bada bing, bada boom, money changes hands, everybody's happy, here's some money for the show, that kind of thing. Doesn't seem like that's going to be it. Also, I'm sorry if anybody says bada bing, bada boom, I am sure that was incredibly offensive. Feel free to cancel me. <laughs> I don't care. But the way that it sounds is you buy individual episodes of a podcast that I do not like. I do not like the idea of podcast episodes turning into the individual songs from an album on an iTunes CD or an iTunes album from 2004, where you could buy the entire album for 10 bucks or buy each individual song for $1.99. I hate the idea of that making its way to podcasting. I doubt that would ever work. I doubt Spotify would ever roll that out. I am guessing they just put it into the into the earnings call to try to keep the investors at bay because the investors are probably saying, hey, we need money. <laughs> you invested how much? Hundreds of millions of dollars into podcasting. How are you going to earn that back? And I think a lot of podcast companies are coming to that point where they realized we invested how much money <laughs> and we didn't earn that back. Uh Oh, and they get into a lot of trouble. They, they go under. I think we may start to see some issues with that. Now, as far as whether or not I would use either of these options, 
Probably not. If I were to monetize my show, I would go the value for value route, the no agenda route. I think there are a couple of no agenda listeners who listen to this show. So in the morning to you, I appreciate you guys. If you don't know what the value for value model is, that is, you don't have any exclusive content. Nothing is behind a paywall. You just provide your listener the opportunity to donate or become a producer of the show. If somebody gets 50 cents worth of value out of your show, they send you 50 cents. If somebody had a life-changing experience, like they went out on a retreat with Jack Dorsey with the Bilderberger group, they'll send in 10 grand. Or maybe somebody thought that it was equivalent to going out and seeing a movie, so they will donate 10 or 20 bucks to you every episode or whenever they feel the need. And I think that is the best monetization model for podcasting because it doesn't close you off to growth. Putting everything behind a paywall, terrible idea in my opinion. It seems as though it would completely kill the potential for organic growth of your show, which as a podcaster is already pretty damn difficult. Growing your show is difficult. You need to put in a lot of legwork. If you add the additional hurdle of, you need to listen to my show, but to listen to my show, you have to pay $5. Good luck growing the damn thing because that likely will not work. With that explanation out of the way, I do not want to monetize my show. I do this for fun. I have fun making this show. It brings me a ton of joy and I don't want to complicate that or have the added stress or complications or pressure of getting money involved. Oh, you have to do a show this week because you have people paying you. I don't want that. That's not my cup of tea. I'm going to keep screaming at you as long as I want. And that's the beauty of it. I will link the TechCrunch article if you want to read more about that. And for everybody out there, go check out the No Agenda Show. Really an excellent, excellent podcast. Next, we have Twitter trying to help you earn money. How is Twitter trying to help you earn money? Twitter acquired a company called Review, R-E-V-U-E, and this is a newsletter company. If you want to access this, you will go to Twitter on your computer. You have to be on the web. Go to Twitter, click on the three buttons, the more button, and then click on newsletter. This will direct you to Review's website, and the entire website is about offering paid, paid newsletters, getting paid for your writing. And at this time, it appears that Twitter is making the service free for all accounts, and all they do is take 5% of the subscription feed to your newsletter. If I had to classify this, I would say this is Twitter's response to a site like Substack. And if I am not mistaken, Substack is kind of like a paid blog where you would subscribe to Glenn Greenwald and you gain access to his journalistic writings. That's kind of what it is. This appears that Twitter wants to capital capitalize on that and earn money off of people sending out newsletters. I don't think they're going to earn the money they think they're going to earn because on Twitter, there are a lot of very, very dumb people. And I will address that a little bit later. But first thing I want to point out, if you are someone who has been thinking, I need to start a newsletter, I need to start an email list to ensure that I don't get deplatformed. Do not use this. Do not use this. That would be stupid. Thinking, I need to ensure that I don't get deplatformed, I'm going to use Twitter's new newsletter service, new email service, that would be dumb. Or if you do decide to go down this route because you already have a huge following on Twitter and you think it would eliminate some of the barriers to entry of getting people to sign up, go ahead and do that. But back up your email list every single day. Because Twitter seems to be one of the most ban-happy services out there, right up there with Facebook. They love banning people, it seems. And the second thing that I want to point out is I think it's very sad that this is only now just rolling out. Right after Trump leaves office and right after Trump gets banned off of Twitter. The reason I think it's so damn sad is there were a number of people who built entire Twitter accounts, massive, massive followings off of replying to every single tweet that Donald Trump would put out. And they would inevitably get tens of thousands of likes and they would leave a link to go buy something somewhere and monetize their hatred and clapbacks at Donald Trump. 
And it's really sad that they missed this tremendous opportunity. Both those individuals clapping back at Donald Trump and Twitter. Twitter could have made a killing off of doing this. They could have made so much money having an integrated pay this person button right next to the Donald Trump clapback. So much missed money. Oh, no. Poor little people. Oh, they, they have nobody to reply to anymore. <laughs> Get a life, losers. It's it's so stupid. Oh, I'm gonna I'm gonna clap back at him every single time he t shut up. God. What a sad, sad life that must be. What a sad life. I can't imagine just sitting there waiting with bated breath for somebody to post so I can reply. Or even sadder, even is that even a proper word? Even more sad. To write a bot to reply to, to, to anybody right after they post. How dumb. And I'm sure that now people are going to say, oh my God, he's a Trump supporter. Oh my God. Shut up. Shut up. Should you use this? Should you use this? Maybe. Probably not. If I were concerned about deplatforming, if I were concerned about getting banned, I would not be using this. Although I do think it's great that they are allowing you to import and export your mailing list. Remember, this is Twitter. I would not import my mailing list. I would not sell out my mailing list like that if you have one. Do not give your mailing list to Twitter. Especially if you are somebody who is concerned about being banned and deplatformed because you're controversial. By uploading and importing your mailing list, all you're doing is saying, hey, Twitter, here's a number of people that you should ban. <laughs> do not do not import it, but export it as much as you can. But you never know. This may be awesome. I will give it a go. And they may make it so easy to subscribe to a mailing list that it's easy to grow a mailing list. And if you do export that regularly, that would be a great way to start your mailing list, and then transfer it over to a service that you have more control over. One thing that I am going to be interested to find is if they require you to input a physical address. That's a reason why I do not have a mailing list at this point, because there are laws that require you to have a physical mailing address on the bottom of every single email that you send out through your newsletter. And I believe that's because if you don't abide by unsubscribe requests, they need to have a physical address to contact you to request that you unsubscribe them from your mailing list. If I'm not mistaken, that's what it's for. So it will be interesting to see how they roll that out. Also, if they do allow you to send out non-paid newsletters, I do not want to sign up for this and make people pay for a newsletter. That's stupid. I don't write anything of value that would be worth putting behind a paywall. If they allow you to just develop a regular newsletter and grow that audience and send out newsletters, hey, new video, hey, here's a little write-up about microphones and here's a video explaining it further or demonstrating it, then cool. Maybe it's worth it. I'll sign up and give it a go. And I will also sign up for Birdwatch maybe if I can because <laughs> I want to I wanna fact check some people. Next, we have some TikTok news and I am very sad that I had to say that phrase. I am still very disappointed that TikTok has not been banned in the U.S. And the news is, TikTok is going to be warning you about bad, bad, stupid information. I will link TikTok's blog post in the show notes, but I am going to read the majority of it for you. I'm going to read this to you because I don't care enough to, to rephrase this. I'm just going to read it. We remove misinformation as we identify it and partner with fact checkers at PolitiFact, Lead Stories, and Sci Verify to help us assess the accuracy of content. If fact checks confirm content to be false, we'll remove the video from our platform. Sometimes fact checks are inconclusive or content is not able to be confirmed, especially during unfolding events. In these cases, a video may become ineligible for recommendation into anyone's For You feed to limit the spread of potentially misleading information. Today, we're taking that a step further to inform viewers when we identify a video with unsubstantiated content in an effort to reduce sharing. Here's how it works. First, a viewer will see a banner on a video if the content has been reviewed but cannot be conclusively validated. 
the video's creator will also be notified that their video was flagged as unsubstantiated content. If a viewer attempts to share the flagged video, they'll see a prompt reminding them that this video has been flagged as unverified content. This additional step requires a pause for people to consider their next move before they choose to cancel or share anyways. We love that our community's creativity encourages people to share TikTok videos with others who might enjoy them, both within our platform and beyond. But we've designed this feature to help our users be mindful about what they share. In fact, when we tested this approach, we saw viewers decrease the rate at which they shared videos by 24%. While likes on such unsubstantiated content also decreased by 7%. Excellent! They saw a 24% decrease in sharing of videos that were marked as unsubstantiated content. I don't see that potentially being abused at all. I wonder if claims that the CCP is running concentration camps would be unsubstantiated, therefore limiting the spread of that unsubstantiated content. I definitely don't see any world where this could easily be manipulated and abused by politicians or world leaders either. Just a thought. Don't see it being abused at all. Something that stuck out to me, the phrase unverified content, it has been flagged as unverified content. The reason that stuck out to me is a couple of months ago when I was talking about the potential revocation of Section 240, I stated that if that were to occur, these companies would have to then vet every single creator that's on their platform. They would have to only allow for verified users to upload. I'm not saying that's what this is because this is very different. They are not banning everybody who is unverified at this point. I think this could just be the very first, the very beginning of this, this story arc, the story arc of limiting the distribution of unverified content. At this point, it's unverified in terms of they're unable to verify the truth of a piece of content. Give it a couple of years, your social credit score will come into play and you will become an unverified person. Just my thought. But hey, private platform, right? I don't use TikTok and I was for a while posting videos onto TikTok. I had an old burner phone I installed it on there and I was taking clips of me from my reviews, throwing boxes and uploading them. I didn't even want the app on a burner phone because I was scared that it was going to have the microphone on listening to me screaming in the other room. I got rid of that app as well. I care so little about TikTok, but I see a growing amount of content being shared across the platform with the TikTok logo in the upper corner. TikTok seems to be taking over, and I think it's great if you folks want to scream into your camera with your big old glasses about, hey, champs, hey, hey, big guy, authoritarianism, stuff like that, more power to you. I am sure that this, this limiting of unverified content won't have any impact on the spread or distribution of COVID-19 information that is not liked by the CCP at all. And I will end by saying this. I look forward to everyone who supports this kind of moderation or controlling of the narrative, getting dinged by it and being confused, thinking I was one of the good ones. I wasn't spreading disinformation, unverified content, unsubstantiated information. Well, it doesn't matter. They can just say we were doing it for the, the health of society because we thought it was unsubstantiated. We had to limit the spread of it because it's potentially dangerous. I will link the TikTok blog post. More power to you if you want to use it. I just think you're a little bit nuts, a little bit crazy for using that app. Now, very briefly, let's talk about what I have been testing. This is a one-off episode because I don't think I used this microphone in the past. This is the Mojave MA201 FET. I used this on the Bandrew Plays channel for a couple of songs. I loved how it sounded. I am listening to it now quite sibilant. I'm hearing my S's a lot more sharply than I normally do. Did I even say a proper word there? Sharply? Sharper? I don't know what the proper terminology there would be. I am a dumb person. Forgive me. But something that I did notice using this is it has a, an amount of weight to it. Some low-end girth heft to it. Makes me sound manlier than I actually am. But that's all I'm telling you. 
we will be reviewing it, or I will be reviewing it, in the next couple of days on the podcast channel. Let me know what you think of this in the comments down below. Now let's jump to what you had to say. The first comment comes from All Eves. He says, Bandrew, bring back the podcast jingle to episode's beginning, or at least explain to me, please, why you've replaced it to the episode's end some time ago. Regards, Sandy. Sandy, thank you very much for the comment, and I will explain exactly why I moved or removed the introduction music from the podcast on YouTube. If you listen to the audio-only version of the show, that introduction music is still there. I say, here's what we're talking about, then the intro music plays. But on YouTube, I say, here's what we're talking about, and then jump right into the topics. That is because on YouTube... You have about 15 to 30 seconds to capture somebody's attention and for them to determine if they are going to continue watching your video. If I say, here is we're going to today we're going to talk about TikTok being a fascist authoritarian group, then I play 30 seconds of music, they're getting no value from that music so they move on. On the audio podcast, there's a little bit of a different dynamic where people will play and they enjoy the 30, 45 minute podcast. They enjoy listening for long periods of time. That's the inherent trait of those who listen to podcasts. On YouTube, a lot of people are not podcast listeners. They are used to short and succinct videos. Getting them to watch a longer form piece of content is extremely difficult. Having a 30 second introduction music clip with no value is going to drive them away immediately. And I did see an increase in views after a couple of weeks of removing that. So it's not that I don't like having that music. I still do enjoy the music. I still have it in the audio format of the show. But on YouTube, given the behavior of people who typically watch videos on YouTube, I have removed it from the YouTube version of the podcast. Hopefully that answers the question. If you do want to hear it, I will go ahead and play it right here. I'll play the intro music right here because why the hell not? I can do it. I can do it. We're we're way deep into the show. Let's play that music right now. I hope you enjoyed that, Sandy. Thank you very much for the question, but I'm not going to add it back into the intro of the YouTube videos. If you want, go check out the audio-only version of the show. The intro music is there for all of the episodes. Next comment comes from Total Smash TV. Support and use the Fediverse. Don't like social media garbage of corporations, Marxists, etc. Your responsibility to use better platforms. Total Smash TV, great, great comment. I am putting out a call to anybody and everybody watching and listening to this. Please tell me how this works. I don't know how the Fediverse works. I understand that you host your own server and then you link it to others. If somebody can explain it to me shortly in the comments section or send in a link to a video or an audio podcast or an article explaining it easily, I would love that. And if it leads to me starting a podcastage server social network, I'll happily do that. I just need to understand how I would go about doing that and if it would be worth it for me. So Total Smash TV, thank you very much for the comment. I will look into that, hopefully, if somebody sends me information on it because I'm a little bit too lazy to go dig in into that right now. I just wanted to get right into recording the episode. And the last comment comes from Andrew, and he says, Hey, Bandrew, thanks for the great content. I was really interested in buying as much as I can outside of the Amazon ecosystem. In addition to Sweetwater, which websites would you suggest ordering audio gear from? Andrew, thank you very much for the comment. Great, great question. I replied to you in the comments, but I am going to include the list that I came up with here and would love to hear from other folks what websites they use in case you do want to avoid ordering from Amazon, the new overlord of the world. My response was Sweetwater, B&H, Musician's Friend, Broadcast Supply USA, and Vintage King. I believe also Tomon, T-H-O-M-A-N-N, if you are in Europe, is a great alternative. 
if you have any other options, link that or list them in the comments on YouTube, youtube.com slash Bandaroo says podcast. And now let's jump to my favorite part of the show, the Ask Bandrew segment. All righty. If y'all got any questions, you can head over to Ask bandrew.com there are instructions on how to send in audio video or text-based questions i do prefer audio and video because then my stupid stupid self does not have to read i suck at reading that's the whole thing that's the joke even though it's not a joke i really do suck at reading send in audio and video and i love audio stuff you love audio stuff we get to hear how you sound on your gear we have five read it or hear it five voice submissions this week yeah it's a good thing waiting five months to reply because you can pull five voice submissions first one comes from david david take it away good sir hi bandrew this is david calling from bonn germany first of all thank you so much for doing all the great content you've been putting out which i've been binge watching and listening to since i found out that you exist now COVID 19 has turned me like many into a self-taught live streaming and audio engineer. Uh, Well, please insert the quotation marks where you see fit. I work for a larger corporation, have got nothing to do with video or audio, but I'm now challenged to do broadcast for our town halls, business meetings and the like over streaming services like Vimeo or simply WebEx for the smaller get-togethers and team meetings. As a tool, I've come to like the ATEM Mini Pro as a video mixer and encoder because A, I like the video encoding done in a dedicated box and B, it has a built-in, well, something like a channel strip for the audio, which allows me to improve it with basic effects like compression and gate. And it also allows me to apply a limiter to the master to improve overall loudness of the stream without clipping. Now to my question. If I don't want to rig up an ATA Mini Pro for my next WebEx, but go light just with a webcam and a USB microphone. By the way, I use the uh, Bayer Dynamic Fox. I know you're not the biggest fan, but anyway, here we go. Do you know of a simple way I could use plugins like a compressor and a de to improve my audio in a WebEx? I run Windows 10, my DAW is Audition, so I guess that's required as a host for the plugins. And I already own a fair number of VST plugins. I appreciate this is a bit of a special use case, but the answer may also be interesting to other listeners and watchers who may be live streaming their podcast and don't have access to their outboard effects while on the go and simply can't get the audio routing to work. Anyway, that's it. Thanks again for being you and the great content. I've learned a lot already and I appreciate you. David, thank you very much for the voice submission and the kind words. I will first start with I am not a Windows user. It is a completely different world for me. I do love me some Microsoft Excel though. Give me Excel. I will work wonders. I will I will do all sorts of formulas. I love me Excel. A piece of software that I absolutely loathe. I hate with all of my being will likely be the solution to your problem. And it is called a voice meter cable, a voice meter cable. I will link the specific app in the description, in the show notes of this episode. But as far as the workflow, you will first have to install this piece of software and that will create a new audio input and a new audio output. The way that I would go about this is I would set up my DAW as though I was normally recording. The audio input is going to be your Bayer Dynamic Fox. On the channel that you're using, you will add all the VST plugins that you want, all the compression, the limiter, all of that stuff. And then in the DAW's output, you will select, instead of the Bayer Dynamic Fox, you will select the voice meter cable output. That's what you will select. Then in the software that you're streaming with, whether it be WebMD or whatever the hell it is, WebEx, I think, or discord anything for the audio input you will not pick the buyer dynamic fox you will pick the voice meter input i believe i believe that's how it works and as far as the latency i'm not sure how that would work because chances are 
as you add more and more effects, you're going to have more and more latency. If you are doing this with video of your face, you're going to run into issues there. If you're just doing audio, I don't think you'll have any issues you'll have. You could have a half second delay and you won't run into any problems. But if you have video of your face and the microphone running through all this processing, I think that's when you would run into issues. But that's my solution. I will link it in the comments or not the comments in the show notes. And I hope that helps. Hopefully that helped you out. Let's jump to another comment from Mr. Eddie G. Take it away, Eddie G. Hey, Bandrew. This is Mr. Eddie G speaking. How's it going, my man? Yo, I'm a big fan. I've been listening to your podcast and been watching your YouTube videos for a long time. And actually, I'm such a fan of your YouTube videos that I've made plenty of purchases based off of your reviews. Um, the only thing is I don't have a lot of money. So when I buy things, I tend to return them just so that I can, you know, buy other things. It's kind of an addiction now, and I sort of blame you. I hope you can sleep at night knowing that now. Anyways, I'm speaking right now into a Zoom H6 into the XY microphone. How does it sound? There is no treatment in my room whatsoever, but I do plan on adding some moving blankets here soon. See if that'll help any. It's my cheapest way that I can go right now. But I do have a serious question, and it's kind of a complicated one, so I hope you're able to understand me. When it comes to audio interfaces, what is a Class A preamp? What is a Class B preamp? What is a Class AB preamp? What is a transformer? What is a discrete preamp? Are all of these things one and the same? Are they completely different? Should I be looking for an audio interface with a Class A preamp? And how come most audio interfaces out there don't distinguish what class preamp they are? Is that even important? Anyways, I hope my question makes sense. If it doesn't, oh well. Bandrew, I'm a huge fan once again. Thank you for all that you do and for your insightful videos and podcast, man. See ya. Thank you very much for the comment or the voice submission, kind sir. And I apologize if I screw any of this up because I am not an engineer. I do not know much about all the internal workings of any of this stuff. It is all magic to me. I pulled a couple of articles. I will link those in the show notes as well. You can see I pull a lot of crap and I link a lot of it because I want you to have the same sources as me. First up, Class A preamp. It provides an accurate representation of the incoming signal, but it is inefficient in terms of power usage because the amp is always on and it has a current available even when the signal is not being sent through the preamp. And Vintage King points out that this would be an issue, especially on tube amps, because since there is a current constantly running through it, that is going to lower the longevity of the tubes. Class B preamps split the waveform in half, and these are more likely to distort. Distort? Distort because each half is replicating the wave, and when the waves overlap, they will distort. According to Vintage King, again, it is not used typically for microphone pre, so you're not going to find that much there. Then you have class A, B preamps, and I don't understand this, but it works as an on-off cycle, reproducing more than half the waveform, which will reduce the majority of distortion while also operating more efficiently. The way that I understood this is the class B preamp splits the signal into two, and they are the exact same signal. Therefore, when they are, when the waves overlap, they will distort. The class AB preamp only recreates 180 degrees on either of the sides, either of the amplifier. So there is, it limits the amount of overlap as opposed to recreating 100% of the waveform on both sides. It is only recreating about 50% of the waveform. So there's going to be less overlap there. That's my understanding of it. Somebody please correct me because I'm a dummy. I'm a dummy. I don't understand this stuff. Then as far as transformer preamp, transformers are just something. I don't know exactly what transformers are, but they impart a color or a certain type of distortion to the sound. Rupert Neve is famous for his transformers. People buy 
specific Neve gear because they like the distortion, the overtones to the distortion that his Transformers create. And all the Transformers from different companies have different sounds to them. Neve is just one of the most famous for his Transformers. You'll find his Transformers and stuff like... I actually have... Sorry about that, I stepped away from the microphone. I have the Rupert, the SE Electronics Rupert Neve RN17, a small diaphragm condenser with a Rupert Neve transformer in the small diaphragm condenser, if I am not mistaken. I think that's what it is. I just wanted to buy some more small diaphragm condensers, so I got that son of a gun. And it has Rupert Neve's name on it, so I'm going to buy it because I am a Rupert Neve fanboy. And discrete preamp. This was pulled from flyingsound.net. Again, link in the show notes. Discrete means that the primary circuit for the mic pre uses individual components that are selected for the best combination from the point of view of the designer. The components are separate or discrete. For example, a tube, op amp, or transistor are examples of a discrete component found in a microphone preamplifier. Alternatively, an integrated circuit or microchip is a small package that contains a very dense layout of semiconductor components. There you go, Mr. Eddie G. I hope that helped you. That was interesting for me as well. I think the most interesting thing for me was understanding exactly what discrete means when they say discrete preamp. That means that they actually spent time sitting down and designing the entire circuit of the interface or the preamp to best perform, as opposed to buying something off the shelf like you might find in a lot of more affordable stuff, which is why you see a lot of similarities between the affordable interfaces. Julian Krauss does a lot of opening up of the interfaces, and he sees a lot of the same preamp and, and A to D converters in there. That's kind of the IC route, the integrated circuit as opposed to a discrete option. Hopefully that helped you. Next, we have a voice submission from Lars. Take it away, Lars. Hey, Bandrew. I emailed you last week with a question about using a Shure SM7B replacement capsule to make a homemade version of the SM7B microphone. Since then, I went ahead with the project and made my own homebrewed SM7B. And I'm actually speaking to you on it now without the base roll off or presence boost enabled or any post-processing. It was a fun project to build and it was altogether less than $200. That said, while I enjoyed the process and the final product is a joy to use, I'm not sure this really saves much money in the long run. I noticed used SM7Bs going for around $350 on eBay, so it seems that you can buy a new SM7B for $400, treat it very well, and sell it a decade later for a $50 discount, which means you can basically rent an SM7B for a decade for about 50 bucks, which isn't bad at all. And while I'm really happy with what I built, I can't imagine selling it years from now because I won't find anyone who understands what it is and be willing to pay the price. So that led me to my new question for you. Do you view your microphone collection as something you will one day liquidate and that you're basically renting the mics for the time being? Or are they an investment? Or do you plan on being buried with them? Love the shows. Please keep it up. Thanks. Thank you very much, Lars, for the voice submission. I think you sound absolutely wonderful. And if anybody is interested in Lars being a maniac and building a homebrew SM7B, I will link his video in the episode notes. Absolutely amazing. Now to the question, do I view my microphone collection or the mics that I have as an investment that I'll liquidate or will I be buried with them? Honestly, as long as I continue to make videos about audio gear, I don't plan on selling them because... In my opinion, that is something that can set me apart from many other, a lot of other YouTube creators in the microphone market. My video format is easily copyable. Somebody could come in and say, I'm going to make the exact same video format as Bandrew on Podcastage, and they can do that. What the majority of people can't do is start up a channel copy my format, and then have access to tens of thousands of dollars of microphones. I wasn't able to do that for years. It took me almost six years to acquire all of this gear to be able to include $6,000, $10,000 worth of microphones that I compare in a single video. That's not a smart thing to do. <laughs> if somebody were to say, I'm going to review the Mojave MA201 FET, 
you know what? I really want to know how it sounds compared to the U87 AI and the TLM 103 and the OC818. So I'm going to spend $7,000 on those microphones so I can compare them for one video. That would be stupid. That would be very, very stupid. So at this point, I think that's what sets me apart from a lot of other creators. I'm the only one dumb enough to spend all the money that comes in from the business on the business and invest in more gear to review and to not just sell it off and not just borrow it and be able to do those comparisons because that's not something a lot of people are going to be able to do. Now, if I ever stop making YouTube videos, the next step before deciding to liquidate everything and pay ungodly taxes on it would be to determine what my next step is. If I were to just disappear off the grid, go live in the woods, I would liquidate a lot of it, but chances are I would keep a dozen microphones. I'm keeping the U87, U67, SM7B, of course, OC818, of course. I'll keep some small diaphragm condensed, of course. I'm going to keep a handful of them. But if I was living in the woods and I wasn't doing anything in terms of continuing to make YouTube videos about microphones, I may consider selling all of them and maybe buying a house with all the money that I, that I earn off of it. But there has been some joking about this, but also some serious talk about how fun it would be to start a microphone museum. And I think that would be incredible. Having a microphone museum that is interactive as opposed to look at the microphone behind the glass. That's not fun. Going to a museum and saying, that's the U67? And I can record on it? Yes, please. Don't mind if I do. So that's a joke and a dream that has been bouncing around for a couple of years, starting a microphone museum that has a recording studio, a studio for recording videos in, a movie theater. Of course, there needs to be a viewing room so I can watch all of my crazy horror movies. There needs to be a good coffee machine there, an oven to cook up some pizzas. I would love nothing more than to have that little compound for microphone museums, people who are interested c can come in, pay whatever, and have access to every microphone ever made and determine what microphone works best for them. That sounds amazing. That sounds super fun. And then in the evenings, I have access to all these microphones. I can go hide in the recording studio, make a podcast, or record some videos about... I, I, does it get better than that? I don't think it does. Now I want to do it even more. No. These are not investments. These are sticking with me until the day I die because I am making a an interactive microphone museum. Mark my words, world. Mark my words. That is happening. Thank you very much, Lars. Again, I will link his video in the description if you want to check that out. Next, we have a voice submission from Jared. Take it away, Jared. Hey, Bandrew. My name's Jared. I'm a big fan of the show. I appreciate all the work that you do, all the content that you put out and the reviews that you do are super helpful. Um, I just had a question about small diaphragm condenser microphones. I've been thinking about buying a matched set. Uh, first of all, how important is it to get a matched set of microphones? What's the significance of that as opposed to just buying them individually? Um, and my budget is about $800 or less for the set. I was wondering if there are any in that price range that you would recommend. Thanks. All righty. What a great question. The reason why you need a matched set of microphones is it's common that the same model of microphone at different periods of production will have slight differences, whether it be the sensitivity of the microphone. You can find microphones that are the same model that are a couple of dB different in their outputs. You could also find minor differences in the frequency response. But if you have a matched pair, those are typically pulled off the line together, manufactured back to back. So the differences in the manufacturing or in the sound and sensitivity will be as minimal as possible. Then, of course, they do have to run tests to ensure that even though they were pulled right off of each other, right next to each other, that they are similar enough to be considered a matched pair. There are also companies, I believe Lewitt is one of them. They have some microphones that are marketed as all pairs are matched pairs. You could buy a microphone one year and one in three years. And they, if they are the same model, 
they are going to be a matched pair. I don't think that works for every model of Lewitt microphones, but they are working on that, and that is pretty, pretty cool. But as far as my suggestion for you, I am going to jump to a very quick sample of two small diaphragm condensers that I have been using recently that I've really been enjoying at two different price points, 200 and 500 for a matched set. Let's jump to that right now. First up, I wanted to include a quick sample of the SE Electronics SE7. This goes for about $100 for a single microphone or $200 for a matched pair. This is a little bit more hyped in the top end, a little bit more boosted in the top end compared to the one I'm going to be comparing it against. But for 200 bucks, I think this is a pretty great option of the small diaphragm condensers that I've tested that are more affordable. This is definitely one of my favorite and it also has a built-in high pass filter and a negative 20 dB pad. So this is the first one that I would recommend 200 bucks, pretty affordable. You still have 600 bucks left over for a bunch of pizza. Let's jump to the next one that I want to demonstrate. And here is the SE Electronics SE8, the cardioid version. This is the big brother to the SE7. For an individual, this goes for $250 or $500 for a matched pair. Very, very affordable for a great set of SDCs small diaphragm condensers. I really enjoy this one. Of all the SDCs that I have used, I think one of my favorites might be the Neumann KMS 180, KM185, but that is 800 bucks or 700 bucks for one of them, not a matched pair. So these are the two that I have really enjoyed using over the past couple of months. I have been on a small diaphragm condenser kick SE7, SE8, Octava MK012 is also very popular, but I don't know about matched pairs with that one. So these are the two that I would recommend. Hopefully that helps you out. And lastly, let's jump to a voice submission from SylvieBot. Take it away, Sylvie. Hello, Banjo. Thank you for taking the time to listen to this. And I'm going to have to get really real here with you with the question I have. Now, on episode 247, you took a question from Reverend Jesse implying that the men in black are potentially androids, a claim he walked back in the comments section. While you said you believed they are regular people working in a misinformation campaign, I happen to have evidence, which leads me to believe both of you were correct and incorrect about various parts of your assumptions. What if instead of a secret organization hiding in the shadows, the group has been in our faces? flaunted even at times. I am of course talking about the men in fur. Furries, if you will. I can hear you now, but Sylvie, that's preposterous, which honestly is exactly why it makes so much sense. Furries don't need to be plucked from society to be integrated into a specialized program. They have already ostracized themselves from their peers, families, and community. Some guy in a black suit is approachable, seemingly trustable even. But if you see a guy coming down the street in a fursuit, you're likely going to run to the other side of the street. You gave some thought in your response to the men in black having relations with each other instead of the general public, which works perfectly in favor of furries, as 76% of them report being in a relationship with another furry. They can even gather for their yips each year at over 40 worldwide cons. This conspiracy gets even deeper. The mid 40s through late 50s was the era of Operation Paperclip, which brought scientists from Germany into the United States, many of which were not just members, but leaders of the Nazi party. During this time, we saw the rise of extraterrestrial investigations, the Roswell event in 47, the birth of Project Sign, Grudge, and Blue Book. So what do Nazi scientists, the introduction of UFO research and furries have in common? Well, all too much when we take a look at the New York Post's article, Alt Furries. Nazis and furries are, in quotes, species mixing. That's right, Nazism is reportedly a part of furry culture. And what is cited as an influential work for the beginning of furrydom? The 1965 movie Kimba, The White Lion, which was released just as Blue Book was reaching its final years. 
Since the 80s, the furries have been able to live among us in plain sight. They have their own Operation Mockingbird manipulating the media on their behalf, making them seem so cute and cuddly. Why would Huffington Post write, and I quote, there's nothing to be afraid of, end quote, and CNN writes about the misunderstood culture of furries. In his message, Jesse spoke of Amanda Waller in Suicide Squad. Well, Will Smith was a member of Suicide Squad, and of course, he was obviously in the Men in Black franchise. But what isn't being talked about is his role as a secret agent who turns into a pigeon in the movie Spies in Disguise. I believe something terrible to have befallen the Reverend Jesse though I think he was trying to get the right message out there. His final video was titled, Pony, but it's sung by Scott Stapp. In my investigations, I found My Little Pony to be one of the leading markers of furries. Meanwhile, Scott Stapp of Creed released the album Proof of Life in 2013, so I have a pretty good suspicion of what Reverend was trying to tell us. In your response, you bring up a book you own from Nick Redfern, writer of several books relating to the men in black. But don't think I didn't catch Redfern is also a cryptozoologist. He could be a plant attempting to throw us off the furry trail by blaming shadowy government organizations. You claim to have never met anyone in black and were tempted with the idea of joining them, but you never denied meeting anyone in fur. So what are you hiding, Bandrew? What do you know about the furries? All right. I am very rarely rendered speechless, but this is one of those times. I have no words for this. This is shocking. This is offensive. I am hurt. Not really, but I, I actually wasn't rendered speechless while I was listening to this a couple of hours ago preparing for this show. While I was listening to it, I walked away from my computer and said, oh, f you. <laughs> I loved it. It was amazing. But let's actually dive into this a little bit. I am going to debunk your theory about men in black really being MIF, men in furries or furries in, I, I don't know. I don't know the proper acronym, but men in black are supposed to fly under the radar. They are supposed to be the prototypical uh, gray man, I think. They're not supposed to stand out. You're not supposed to say, oh, my God, there is a man in black. Uh, everybody follow him. Let's see who he's investigating or she's investigating. We got to be inclusive. I think that's the goal of them being dressed in just a black suit, white shirt, black tie, kind of like Mormons. They kind of look Mormon. Let's be honest. Maybe that's what men in black really are. They're just Mormons. Whoa, oh, my God. Oh, my God. Uh, what if? The entire Men in Black thing is not a government thing. It's not a government operation. It is an operation by the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. What would their what would their goals be? Oh my god. If for the record, I am not feeling suicidal. If I turn up dead, I was on to something. Keep that in mind. But <laughs> I seriously hope I don't get killed for saying this. I think Mormons are pretty nice. Mormons are pretty nice. I don't think they'd whack me, but who knows? I think furries would draw way too much attention to themselves. If I want to take your, your proposition seriously, I think furries would draw way too much attention to themselves. Men in black want to be able to walk right past you and not have you notice them because then they can turn right around and follow you. If you're walking down the street and you see a big furry bear walking down with a, a, a hole in the pants area, you're going to cross the street, like you said. Then when that bear turns around, runs across the street and starts, starts to follow you, you're going to take notice. And that's going to blow their cover. So I think I disagree. I, I reject your, your, your assertion that furries are the true men in black. That's my take. <laughs> you're, you're an absolutely insane person, and I appreciate every second of it. And I don't think that Rev Jesse, I don't think he is okay. I think he's been body snatched. I'm concerned about him, Rev Jesse. I hope you stay safe, bud. All right. I think that's going to wrap up for today. I appreciate you all coming by, listening to me rant and scream and, and uh, cry at the moon, whatever the hell people do. 
I hope you have an amazing Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Next Sunday, I will talk at you and with you. I love you. Thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. I will talk to you next week. Stay safe. Bye. Oh, yeah, it's the Super Bowl, isn't it? Happy Super Bowl, everybody. I didn't even think people were able to play, play football this year. Apparently, you are. Apparently, you are, and I don't care in the slightest. I'm going to tell you a quick story. I thought this was over. No. I'm leaning back. We're having story time. I have a minute left on my camera. The story time is I used to care about football a lot. Then I realized I was spending four to six hours every single Sunday watching football, sitting on my butt, being unproductive, and I decided no more for me. No, thank you. I'm going to go and do something productive. And do you know what I did? I started screaming into a microphone every single Sunday. And I think it's much, my time is much better, <laughs> much better well spent. Maybe I should spend some time on Sunday taking speaking lessons because I'm a dumbass. All right, I'll talk to y'all later. Bye. This has been a Geeks Rising production. Your executive producer is Bandrew Scott. For more information, head over to www.geeksrising.com.